Welcome back to the Electronics Inside, the show where we tear down tools, toys and appliances just to find out what's inside. In this episode we're going to be looking at a rechargeable and waterproof. Not every box is a winner. It really does just say rechargeable and waterproof on all sides. It doesn't actually explain what the product is. And for anyone that's familiar with the uh, recent UK CA mark in replacement for the European CE mark, that ain't it. I sound like I'm being super derogatory here, and I shouldn't be. I've had plenty of tools from the budget end of the spectrum that have served me incredibly well and have proved really good value versus more expensive versions which I don't feel offer many benefits. However, it does worry me that this doesn't come with uh, proper certification uh, and quality marks when this is supposed to be something you would strap to a pet and has the ability to issue electric shocks. We'll get into it and see how much of a risk that really is. So in the box we have the collar itself, uh, the remote control, a 5.2 volt charger with a USB port, the inevitable collar parts, some different sort of rubbery nipple bits to go over these, which I think are actually like the electric shock prong kind of things. Let's not get too far ahead. Oh, that USB port has actually got two barrel jacks on it. So I assume these both charge on barrel jacks. Yeah. And some instructions, which I've no doubt will be the perfect continuous prose of English. And do you know what? They haven't even printed it in center of the front cover. Maybe that's me being a little, little too much. So shock, vibrate, play a sound, light. Oh, oh! Despite saying please charge before use, it actually turned on. It was unexpected. Ooh. very quiet but oh torch on it a little reluctant to put my fingers on that and test the electric shock sorry if anyone's disappointed by that although I do remember when I was younger for Christmas one of my I bought one of my friends this little uh I think it was like a little remote control car racing game and if you shot with a little infrared light the other person's car they got a shock through their remote control it was awesome he hated it and had to take it back. But you know, you live and learn. So I'm also interested to find out what frequency this is gonna work at, because I don't feel like this has been through proper FCC um, certification. I feel like that may well interfere. It could be 2.4 gigahertz, could be 433, could be 888. I think are the, the open back the frequencies. Could be something totally disallowed. The only way we're gonna find out is by getting into it. This is clearly being built to a budget, which is not a criticism. I appreciate a cheap product as much as anyone, but on that basis, I'm kind of surprised to see it's got screws at all. As you're going cheaper and cheaper, metallic parts, they stick out as an expense, which may not have been needed, as well as assembly time. Oh, for some reason that lithium polymer battery was a surprise to me. I don't know why I didn't expect to see it there, but there it is. So that is a 3.7 volt, 300 milliamp hour. That's not a lot. Large antenna. Uh, I'm going to, so that's not 2.4 gigahertz. So that's going to be something longer wavelength than that. Oh, screws on the board as well. Check this out. For that budget manufacturing, that over molding to get the yellow plastic in molded over the black. Actually kind of nicely done. I'm. I think they said on here that it's waterproof. I mean, I hope they only mean this bit because that's not waterproof in the least. No gasket between the halves. The membrane buttons aren't going to be keeping any water out, certainly not around the screen. What am I missing here? There's supposed to be a backlight for that screen. Oh, okay. So that is actually a diffuser for the light. You've got two surface mount LEDs left and right side of the screen. The screen is just mounted on the antistrophic material. In fact, it's sort of wobbling about there. I'm surprised it hasn't already fallen off. 
and these are just little diffusers so the light's sort of taken in by these two semicircular bits on the bottom side and diffuses light behind the LCD. It's a neat sensible solution. You've got a huge, what's that, 10 mil LED as your torch and just a couple of ICs on here. Wow, tiny text on these. In fact, that IC has got no markings on it whatsoever. I have to look up what this IC is. I would suggest that's probably a microcontroller. And that's probably an RF controller transmitter. Um, you look, you can follow the traces and this sort of fixed distance or fixed resistance uh, trace on the PCB actually runs up here towards the antenna assembly. Little IC up there probably an amplifier still no sign of what frequency it is so this part this is this half the bit the animal wears that's got to be waterproof hasn't it it's got the little silicon covers on or rubber covers over the charging port so so we've got the same 300 milliamp hour battery on the inside again i mean oh no there is actually a gasket on the bottom of there so i can just encourage that out so there is actually a sort of gasket to seal between the two halves, which is sensible. If an animal's gonna wear it, you can't. If you ever try to keep a dog on a walk out of a stream or a river, it, it can't be done. A little bit tentative around the... Uh... What? <laughs> right. Okay, so this part up the top is the barrel jack. Now that's actually a nice solution where you've got this properly potted and sort of epoxied or celastic or silicon, whatever the waterproofing mechanism is. And similarly, there's a little diaphragm that presses on the tactile switch with a... Brilliant, now I've turned it on. <laughs> Gonna be checking out how to turn that off. Okay, so sorry, I was saying, got the little... Uh, receiving antenna down here which coil again makes me think 433 megahertz is likely for this um but i was saying i re actually really like the battery connector so you've got all the waterproofing around here you've got the long reach tactile switch and then you've got this spring which is deliberately tight around the outside so when you think of a coiled spring you think of it pushing pressure axially could i call it that whereas this is actually applying pressure uh, like constricting around its radius so it'll actually pull around the outside of that outer sheet and then that pin in the center which i'm guessing is negative because negative center is always the way to go actually presses on another little spring right on the pcb that's kind of a neat little solution it means there's no wires no they're having to solder this and then pack in little parts. It's, I would give that a good solution. Now, you'll notice I'm being really ginger around this because I only think I've turned this off. The battery is soldered on and I've got this whacking great transformer here, which I can only assume is used to give the electric shocks, but I cannot see for the life of me how that is giving electric shocks because there are no metallic conductors or parts that are presented towards the animal. I mean, if you imagine that these big pointy bits are supposed to be there, it makes sense that they would vibrate and the animal would feel it. But I don't understand how the electric shock is supposed to get through. I can put a multimeter on there and test it, but nothing on there looks like it's gonna do it. To the extent that we've got this huge transformer, which is probably one of the largest parts on the bill of material here, which is supposed to boost a, a voltage, which is probably just being sent a really rough square wave because for, for that tactile feeling of shock, you want high voltage, low current, but the output terminals are just kind of there. Okay, we've got some Celastic over one side. Oh, the haptic motor right here, that's fun. Why don't I throw this back together? Oh, it's totally worth it. Vibrating motor, nothing more or less special than an off-center mass that spins on a motor. And in this case, does a great job of vibrating across the table. I mean, it's definitely receiving something on that press, but I just cannot see how that's escaping the device. How can we test this without hurting myself? Okay, let's get a meter, see what we can do. So I'm gonna put this in there and there. I'm going to stick that onto volts AC up to 400. 
we're not actually interested in sort of RMS and true voltage or anything. We're just basically trying to see if any voltage is coming out of this when, well, let's find out when it's on and when the transformer's actually active too. Turn it on. Nothing so far, which is largely as expected. Oh yeah, that's, that's registering a voltage. We can bump that up to 10, which goes to 0.5 volts AC. Again, it's not gonna be true RMS. Take that right up as high as it'll go. 99. That hits a not insignificant, like 34 volts. Nearly 40 volts. So yeah, I mean, it's outputting the voltage for you. What I'm now interested in is, can that voltage actually get anywhere? So I'm gonna put this into a resistance. I'm putting it in resistance, not diode, because uh, we'll continuity check, because I'm not convinced that anything we see here would be enough to, no. <laughs> oh. Wow. Well, color me surprised. If you, and we're gonna to struggle to see this because it's black on black. These two little sort of rubberized pads here, there and there, are actually conductive and they press on those prongs of the transformer and they are conductive all the way through here. You can sort of see almost like traces where they're sort of potted into the inside of the case coming around here and then sealed in. So actually these two prongs will conduct electrically. There's like um, 2.5 kilo ohms from there to there and 700 ohms from there to there. So you're not gonna get the full load of that out, but I'm now really intrigued to put this all back together and actually measure the voltage across here when you get shocked. Yes, all right, in hindsight, I probably should have done that before we started, but never mind. Just out of curiosity to find out what sort of waveform we are getting out of this, um, I've just connected up a scope to the output side of the uh, transformer. And yeah, we are getting very, very short pulses, but of up to 50 volts on the output side of the transformer. Um, and they're pulses with big gaps. So we're getting sort of almost nanosecond type pulses every two and a half milliseconds. So they're very fast, but very high voltage or reasonably high voltage. I mean, no, we're not talking hundreds or even thousands of volts, but that's enough to feel uncomfortable, but not enough to generate the kind of, uh, the current in the muscles or the skin that would be damaging. Now, with this being battery powered, there's no, there's no path for that current to really want to travel down to earth. It's going to want to complete the circuit between the positive and the negative or the, the two output terminals of the transformer. So this is not something that you could sort of get electrocuted across your heart or something like that. And that's the glory of isolating transformers is that they, they prevent that return to earth path which is why you use isolating transformers in the UK, you use them for shaving sockets in bathrooms. Um, you will also see them in medical applications. I think we talked about them when we were looking at the uh, electrocardiogram some time back. So yes, in theory, it is safe. I'm not planning on putting any part of my body across those two terminals anytime soon. Even if it only hurts, I won't be doing it soon. <laughs> well. I hope you found this in an interesting teardown. If you've got an idea for a teardown or have any comments on this one, head over to the Element 14 community. You'll also find Workbench Wednesdays, DC to Daylight, and of course, Friday Projects. Head over there, get in touch with us, let us know what you think. Thank you for joining me. I'll see you next time.